What does emptiness feel like in gaming? You and your trusty steed, riding the barren landscapes without a single thing in sight. Ask Shadow of the Colossus and it will tell you that it feels immersive. Shadow of the Colossus released in 2005 stands as a testament to how to create a game that truly stands behind the direction of its art. It's a work of art, dancing on our television screens. The game's storyline focuses on a young warrior named Wander, appropriately named, who enters a forbidden world and must travel across an immense landmass on horseback and defeat 16 massive beings known simply as Colossi in an effort to restore life to a girl named Mono. Wander makes his way to the Shrine of Worship in tow with a stolen and sacred sword capable of slaying these beasts and at that moment hears a voice of a disembodied entity known as Dorman calling out to him. He says that Mono may be resurrected if he can slay all 16 colossi across the world known as the Forbidden Lands. Mono represents the main story piece and a giant puzzle that the player must fill in as he or she journeys across the world of Shadow of the Colossus. Much is unknown and it's that emptiness that calls out to the player as we progress through the game in search of answers. Most games leading up and following Shadow of the Colossus focused on cramming as much shit into their games and stuff our screens as full as they could, forgetting that the most effective brush a painter has has no color. The empty spaces in a painting often highlight what is actually painted. This comes across in the game. Wander and his horse are often dwarfed against the background of some amazing landscapes and enemies, both of which delight in their awesome scale and unique art style. Nothing seems generated by a computer program, more like someone crafted it with their own hands. When games open themselves up to you via exploration like this, they are games that respect us as players. It's a breath of fresh air, giving the freedom to fill in the story with our own interactions through the game. A lot is unsaid and unfinished too. As a result, the game is powerful because we are forced to take more ownership of the experience when we are accountable for being intelligent enough to dissect the game. Shadow of the Colossus says, no, I don't need things in my game. I don't need to throw anything at you. You're a guest, I'm the world. I'm living and I'm breathing, I'm organic. The minimalistic nature of Shadow of the Colossus is definitely its greatest asset. Wander and his horse enter the game with a blade that can be bathed in sunlight to show the way to the first Colossus. You begin at a centralized point in an expansive landscape, and every time you find and defeat a Colossus, you are returned to the centralized point. Thus, Progression in Shadow of the Colossus occurs in cycles, and returning back to square one after defeating an enemy feels like you've come full circle, and you're on to the next one. There are no enemies in the game, no side stories or optional objectives. The environment and the Colossi are the only inhabitants. Defeating Colossi is a puzzle. Each has a weakness that can be found and exploited within each environment. Most of the time, you'll be Indiana Jones, climbing, scaling, and riding atop the beasts, maneuvering so delicately and trepidatiously to get to each boss's weak point, indicated by a glowing sigil. The sigil feeds off energy through Wander's blade. So you could say that not only is Shadow of the Colossus a cyclical video game, but the sword represents hope and guidance in times of uncertainty. The great thing about designing a game like this is that the game doesn't just draw a yellow line underneath your feet and point you to the right area. It's built in thematically through the blade, elegantly and subtly painted into the world very naturally. You'll often be fighting while mounted atop Agro, your steadfast horse companion. And the forbidden land is full of beauty, from the steep mountain cliffs of the north region to the seascapes and jagged ocean terrain of the south. A massive stone bridge separates this beautiful peninsula from the mainland. The scale is intense. It's a beautiful reconstruction of fantasy-style landmass nature. There is plant life, and even a few animals you'll find in your travels, but everything feels still and at peace. It's hard not to feel like an invader, like you're bringing in some restlessness into an otherwise quiet world. Everything you kill feels like an act of desecration. Even the colossi, the lumbering behemoths wallowing in the distance, feel more like a part of the environment than adversaries themselves. You are doing this out of love for this strange girl, and while your actions feel heroic in lieu of this, your efforts also feel like sacrilege. You're a stranger in a strange world, riding around killing stuff, 
and disturbing the otherwise peaceful nature of the forbidden lands. It all feels bittersweet. It can often feel quite lonely as well. The solemn tone of the art and musical score create a very isolated environment that weighs down on you in your travels. Everything is huge, awesome, and dwarfs you. It's intentional and practiced, this technique, often used in filmmaking, and it's called high-angle cinema photography. It's a technique that positions the camera above and down so that the lens is looking down on whatever is being shot. Movies do this all the time, and it produces like a feeling of dominance or subduing. High angles are often used in Shadow of the Colossus. It makes us feel, sometimes fear, loneliness, isolation, and timidness. And those feelings are compounded in the game because the environments often dwarf the player in scale. Put those two techniques together, and it's easy to feel like a small fish in a very big pond. As Wander and Agro travel through the Forbidden Lands and slay beasts, something happens to you ever so slowly. Each beast drops a fragment of Dormin, and they become absorbed into Wander's body. Those essences deteriorate him, his skin becomes paler, his hair darker, and dark streaks start growing across his face that entrench themselves into his skin. It feels draining and transformative, and it leaves you curious as to just how things are going to progress as you continue on your quest. This transformation is very representative of the theme in Shadow of the Colossus. Am I losing myself as repayment for the sins I'm committing? Peace for Mono requires destruction of the Colossi, and hope for Wonder requires sacrifice of his own self. Loss, hurt, hope and struggle, they are powerful assets that strengthen the overall experience in the game. After 12 Colossi are slain, Dorman urges Wander to pick up the pace as he tells him that a group of enemies pursue the lad and his loyal horse. With this news, Wander and Agro make haste and slay the remaining beasts. The aftermath that ensues is best left unsaid to the unaware, but you can rest assured it's a quite sad ending, dripping with bittersweet tones. It's also an ending that connects to the events in Eco and marries some of the overall themes of the two games together. Shadow of the Colossus represents a few things that are rarely achieved in video games. A cohesive and rich art design, elegantly crafted immersion, built in by leaving much of the story pieces unsaid, and a deep sense of polish brought on by Team Eco. You can tell this game was built with love. It's less about the moments and more about the journey with Shadow of the Colossus. Many people won't feel drawn to this game, and that's okay. But those accepting of this strange and tranquil pilgrimage through the Valley of the Forgotten Lands will feel the deep tremor of emotion left in the wake of the final few moments of the game. Team Eco's next original IP, The Last Guardian, releases October 25th this year. I can't wait. Uh, I will be doing a preview for this game in the next few weeks, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Until then, take care, and we'll see you next time.